yeah, we back. Yeah, we back. Now, I'm minding my business. I wake up on this Monday morning and I see O'Shea Duke Jackson and Shea Charday going back and forth. Now, these are two content creators in the black YouTube space that I have a lot of respect for. In fact, both of these individuals have been watching my channel since my channel was very small. I believe uh, O'Shea Duke Jackson even commented on my channel on a video that I did of him about two years ago. Let's take a look up on the screen. At the top, O'Shea was like, I thought you said we a bunch of corny dudes with a microphone, huh? You even got a video about me and most guys on black YouTube. Hopefully, you'll be big enough one day that I'll return the favor. Stay hustling. And I was like, salute. He was like, salute, bro. And when it comes to Shea Charday, I believe that she is definitely a silent um, listener of my channel. And we've never interacted. We've never had a conversation. But I can tell that we definitely agree on most things when it comes to society and how the world operates. And of course, as you already know, she's a black wife to a black husband. So, you know, those women are definitely, you know, upper caliber, high caliber. So as it relates to topics such as black love and black relationships, me and Shea Charday, we are in lockstep, even though we never had a conversation. But I see O'Shea put out a video this morning in response to Shea Charday in regards to a video that she made about him about a week ago or so. So I'm going to be playing that video. I never watched this video, so it's going to be a live reaction. And then I'm going to come in and out my commentary. Let's get it. Now we're getting into whether or not black people should delineate, which again, I don't know how O'Shea Duke Jackson is delineating in Uganda, benefiting from their nation, running a successful business, no shade, engaging, dating their woman, running dating shows, intermingling with women of other lineages while promoting delineation i this is where i'm like this whole delineation argument to me doesn't make any sense but you fled to africa you fled to uganda what are you if you guys don't know that is youtuber shay Charday. she is a lovely youtuber a woman i really have a lot of respect for and i think she's an intellectual juggernaut it's just that sometimes people can agree to disagree i also believe that she has a great love for black people as such myself but she wants to know why I believe that we need to delineate as the FBAs, even though I'm an African-American living in Africa. I'll tell you why. I came to Uganda in 2017. Prior to that, I was very pro African-American, like real horror body before the term FBA or hashtag ADOS came out because I had lived in Europe a little bit and I had some experience with some Africans in America and I really wasn't having it. Now, O'Shea Duke Jackson says that he was the original American patriot before you new niggas came into the building. That's what he's basically saying, right? And that's a fact. As somebody that has watched O'Shea Duke Jackson for several years, that's absolutely a fact. Before it became trendy, before it was the wave, back when all y'all was going to watch the Black Panther talking about Wakanda forever, O'Shea Duke Jackson was on YouTube talking about, nigga, fuck Africa, nigga, it's America, nigga. Like, I remember, I used to be in, I used to be in the comment section like, bro, you're bugging out. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> swear to God, bro, swear to God. Way before Tariq Nasheed, way before the rest of y'all came into the building, way before Yvette Carnell, O'Shea Duke Jackson was standing on American business. I remember that. He was shitting on Africa. He was like, nigga, fuck the continent. Nigga, the continent ain't about nothing. Nigga, it's America. It's the stars and stripes. It's the red, white, and blue. Nigga, that's what I'm banging. That's what O'Shea Duke Jackson was on back in the day, right? Now, he's not being completely honest with what he's saying because like I've said many times on my channel, individuals who tend to lead towards that ideology, they don't even have much firsthand experience with the people they're even talking about, right? Like, for example, I believe O'Shea Duke Jackson, he's from Sacramento, California. You know, I'm sure it's probably a few Africans down there, a few, you know, black folks from different places down there, but it, that's not a hot spot. That's not a destination city where you're going to find just whole boatloads of black immigrants. And so what I'm saying is, O'Shea Duke Jackson, he even said it. It wasn't until he became an adult. That's when he really began to, you know, mix and mingle with the Africans and mix and mingle with different nationalities like that. But in his formative years as a child and as a young man, you wasn't really around the Africans like that. You probably was around the Mexicans. You know, you was probably around the Cambodians in California, but you wasn't really around the Africans and the Jamaicans and the Haitians like that in Sacramento. Tell the truth, big brother. Tell the truth. And also, as somebody that's been watching your channel for a very long time, something you're not telling your audience is that, you didn't really come up in a pro-black household like that. You didn't really come up in a household that was standing on blackness like that. You came up, you grew up in a church, right? Your dad was a pastor, right? 
You also said that your dad was on drugs, right? And because I respect my elders, I'm not gonna insult your mother on, on this video, but you also admitted on your channel that your mom was the tap dancer. Your mom was a your mom was a sambo. And it's not her fault, right? We are all victims of miseducation, but you have admitted that your mother is a victim of miseducation. She believes in a lot of stereotypes about Africa and the continent and the black race in general. Your mother doesn't have a high opinion of black people. You've admitted this on your channel, right? So your mom was a sambo and your dad was a drug addict. So is it safe to admit, O'Shea, that growing up in your formative years, you did not receive the best image and the best indoctrination when it comes to your self image as a black man and when it comes to your fellow black people? Right. You came up in the 80s in California, probably a whole bunch of gang banging, a whole lot of, you know, crazy shit. So you did not be you were not instilled with a positive image of your people. So growing up, of course, you would grow up to be a man and be like, nigga, fuck African, nigga, fuck them black folks over there. Nigga, it's America. It's red, white and blue. It's American business. Right. Because you grew up in a lot of ignorance. Right. Tell the truth. Right. It wasn't because you went to Poland and, oh, I wasn't having that. I meant the Africans and I wasn't. No, bro. You were already instilled prepackaged with a lot of ignorance as a child right tell the truth bro tell the truth and it wasn't until you left your city it wasn't until you did some traveling you went to the continent you shook hands and had conversations with brothers from different places and you realized man these brothers ain't so bad you know man you know it was me that was ignorant you know it was me that was ignorant it was me who had to change my ideology and that's what you did you changed your ideology right yeah you changed now you became the pan-african o'shea but you still got your roots and your ignorance still now let's continue and I had some experience with some Africans in America, and I really wasn't having it. It wasn't until I met a good buddy of mine, Nee Adara Big Bay, who was a lifesaver when I came to Poland. And he got me involved in the Nigerian Independence Day, and I became very involved in the African community. And between him and my good buddy, Search for Uhuru, AKA Dinah Samir, it made me want to take my first trip to Africa, which I traveled to Uganda back in 2017. First few days was rough, <laughs> but man, I loved it. Never looked back. And ever since then, I've had a love affair with this continent and with its people. Now, salute to O'Shea. Now, O'Shea even did a, did an interview a few years ago. Take a look up on the screen. Why I left America and I'm living my best life in Uganda featuring O'Shea Duke Jackson. So, obviously, you know, I want to salute to O'Shea for, you know, like, as a man, as men, when we are introduced to new information, then we adjust our worldview. So, I respect that. And I believe that every step of the way, you have been genuine every step of the way. Even back when you were standing on American business, I believe that that's genuinely how you felt. And even as you adjusted, you went, you traveled, you met some brothers from different places, you know, you traveled the world. I believe that that was genuinely how you felt. You adjusted your worldview. I don't think you're like a Tariq Nasheed who is simply pushing propaganda. Like, I don't believe that Tariq Nasheed is really standing on the business that he claimed that he's standing on. I believe that he's standing on economic business. I believe that he's standing on financial business. I believe that he's standing on a profitable business, but I don't think he's really standing on American business. Um, I feel like you've been genuine every step of the way, but uh, let's continue. But again, it comes with a certain level of heartbreak, a whole lot of despair, many of which I don't talk about. And I want to address Shay Charday because she wants to know, how should we delineate when I'm in Africa and not in Sacramento? First of all, many other people who live other places across the country or across the world, their opinions should not have any idea about where they live. For examples, you have Indians who live in America. You have Indians who live in Africa. You have the Chinese who live in Africa. Don't they delineate? Now, I call bullshit on this section because I remember O'Shea specifically making a video after the Haitian community in Long Island, New York, had did a counter protest to Donald Trump when he came into the city. And I remember O'Shea basically saying, basically disparaging the Haitians saying, oh, why are you waving your flags in the United States? You know, why are you representing for your people over here? You should be back home over there. Well, Shea Chardet basically redirected that same question back to you, right? You claim to be standing on American business and delineation, but you're over here in Kampala, Uganda, reporting live from the villages in Uganda, making videos on the migrant crisis in the United States. Bro, it doesn't make any sense, right? It doesn't make any sense, bro. You sitting up in the goddamn dust in Uganda, making videos on a migrant crisis in the United States. I'm sorry, bro. Shea Charday is well within her rights to clown the fuck out of you for that, bro. That don't make no damn sense. And I was disappointed in you, especially O'Shea, when you made that video against the Haitians who protested against Trump when he came into the city, right? Because 
they were standing on they were standing on blackness. They were standing on black business, right? The white man said some stupid shit about us. So nigga, we pulling up on you. We pulling up on your goofy ass. And as a black man, you should have respected that. But you tried to push the line for Tariq Nasheed and say, Oh, why are you over here? Go back to your country. Why are you why, why are you why are you yelling at the white man? Why are you disrespecting the white man? That nigga, you you were standing on coon business, man. You were standing on Sambo business, trying to tap dance and cheerlead for Tariq Nasheed, bro. Because I understand. You and Tariq Nasheed, you share a lot of the same followers and the same subscribers. So you can't really stand on, on you know, international black business too heavy. You can't really stand on, on Pan-African business too heavy because your audience got a lot of uh, American Sambos in it. And I get it. I understand it. But listen, you're not very consistent in your ideology. It's because you were not given that firm foundation as a child. I think that that's what it comes down to, right? The reason why your ideology is so, you know... It changes by the year. It changes by the by the decade. Is because you weren't really given a firm foundation as a child. You see, me, my foundation is solid, bro. My foundation is I've, I've been like this since since a child. I've been standing on blackness since a child. So you know, it's it's firm, right? Like my ideology can't change by a simple interaction. Like my shit is solidified, bro. My shit is solidified, man. Anyway, let's continue. The difference between me as an African American is I actually thought that I was a brother. And to a certain degree, I still do. I actually look and still look at Africans as myself. But the reality was is that I was giving that respect to people just based on the fact that they were black. And it's not just Africans that do that to blacks, right? So I wanna make that clear. I was trying to get ingratiated into what it was to get back on the continent and how things can work. But then again, I found myself basically being a victim of what I'm talking about, which is the lidiation, which means that people were able to get me for what I knew and what I could offer while withholding what they could offer from me. And that is the issue there. I don't have a problem working with the black world or working with the black continent or working with black people. I love black people. Now, this is what I mean when I say your foundation is not solid, right? Just like how your ideology was able to change by a simple positive interaction. Look how quick your ideology is able to change by a negative interaction, right? There's not a, a firm foundation there. And I believe that's because that was not instilled in your childhood. Like I said, drug addict father, Sambo mother. You know, no offense, big bro, but, you know, got to tell it like it is. But when it comes to me, my foundation was solid. That's why I'm one of the greatest uh, Pan-African commentators in the world, right? Because... I'm really about this life. So a simple interaction, a negative interaction with another black man or a black woman cannot simply shift my ideology, right? O'Shea Duke Jackson said he relocated to the continent, started a business on the continent, and is obviously making way more money and having way more opportunities available to him on the continent than he would have in Sacramento, California. That's why he fled to the continent. Now, the fact of the matter is this, bro. You living in Uganda, you are able to afford yourself a standard of living that would be impossible for you to obtain back in Sacramento, California, right? Even if you were pulling in the same amount of views, had the same number of subscribers, the cost of living in California, the taxes and everything else, you would not be able to replicate the same success. And you know what I'm saying is facts. Now, in that section of the video, O'Shea talks about, oh, when I got to the continent, I thought it was going to be brotherly love and I found myself becoming a victim. So listen, O'Shea, I'm going to draw the comparison because you're doing business on the continent and I'm doing business in New York City right like i mentioned before my father owns multiple pharmacies in the area so we do business all week long right we dispensing drugs to the population and if i allowed my personal interactions with the black folks that i just come across on a daily basis to have an influence over my personal ideology over my foundational ideology then i would not be a black man that stands on what i stand on i would not be a black man with the ideology that i have because throughout my life right i've had black men rob me put a gun in my face i've had black men shoplift from the store i've had black women try to get shit on a discount try to get it on a tab never come back and pay i've had so many instances of black folks trying to cross me and betray me and lie to me and shit like that but i never let that i never let these personal petty interactions be the source of me saying man fuck black folks man i'm man fuck pan africans man man fuck this fuck this they using me they trying to get the the, the, the hookup discount the black discount this that and the third because my ideology is solid and i believe that o'shea your ideology is simply it's not solid right it's not solid your ideology is not solid bro because just by the fact that a few positive interactions made you put down the red, white, and blue, and you picked up the, the red, black, and green, the Marcus Garvey, and then a few negative interactions had you pick up the red, white, and blue back up again, it goes to show, brother, you ain't solid. You ain't solid, man. You ain't solid. And like I said, that's not your fault, man. I, like I always say, I think it goes back to your upbringing. I think it simply goes back 
to your upbringing. You know, a lot of folks come into my comment section. They ask me, bro, how come you so young and your mind is so dynamic? How come, you know, your mind is so, you know, three dimensional? That's because, bro, when I was five, six, seven, eight years old, I used to I used to walk around the house and my, my mother and father and their friends and my grandmother and things like that. They sit around the table, you know, drinking beer and having heated debates on geopolitics and history and things like that. And I would just be soaking up the game, right? Just soaking up right under their nose. And I always make mention of my mother and my grandmother on my channel because they definitely instilled a lot of the knowledge and mentality that I have into me, right? That's why I always thank my father and my grandfather for choosing the caliber of women that they chose, right? My grandmother, 95 years old, just had a stroke like six months ago. She in a wheelchair. She's still listening to the international news, still having debates on geopolitics, you know? Listen, so my shit was solid. My foundation was solid, bro. You know, my foundation was solid. Both my parents are professionals. Like I said, your dad was on drugs and your mom, you know, your mom was a Sambo. So that, that you didn't have that foundation, bro. So I think it really comes down to, you know, I, I, we, we taking no shade of therapy today. It really comes down to your upbringing, man, your foundation. When you was coming up, you didn't really have any direct interactions with the Africans and, you know, things like that. You grew up around the Mexicans and the Cambodians and the Filipinos in California. So like I said, man, I think it really goes deeper than what you're saying. You know, and if you ask me, I just think that like the foundation got to be a little more solid, man. You can't really be letting these personal interactions um, really cloud your, ide your ideology, man. Because like I said, it hurts me too, man. When, when black folks come into the store and shoplift from the store, that, that hurts me, man. Because I would have get that to you for the discount, man. I would I would have worked something out with you, but you came into the store and stole from the store, man. You know, it was a time earlier in the year where it was just a wave of folks like targeting the store, right? So much so because they targeted the Walgreens in the area so much, the Walgreens closed down. So they went to other pharmacies in the area. They started hitting up the store heavy, 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 heavy over a course of a few months. And it was all it was all my own people doing that, bro. You think I came onto the YouTube, man? Fuck black black people man the black they using us they stealing from us they no no i still came onto the i still came onto the youtube i was still standing on black business now let's continue for an example i have an african diaspora group that i run here in uganda of course there are some ugandan americans in the group and guess what they feel like they need to delineate simply because they're ugandan americans and they're just not you know raised here in uganda or they're ugandan british so they feel differently than even we do because they're in the same situation that we're in they feel people here feel like they're not really ugandan or they're not really african like them so again they feel more comfortable or more closer sometimes to us now, in this section of the video, O'Shea talks about the different subcultures in Uganda. How there's the Ugandans born in Uganda, then there's the Ugandans born in the West, and how they differentiate amongst each other. And that's totally normal. It happens across all ethnic groups. Same way you have Haitian Americans and you have Haitians back on the island. Same way you have Jamaicans and Jamaicans back on the island. Same way you have, uh, what's it called, Nigerian Americans and Nigerians back on the, back on the continent. That's totally normal. You even got subcultures within the subculture. For example, you got Haitian Americans that are from New York, and that's its own culture by itself. Then you got the Haitians down in Florida. That's its own culture by itself. Then you got the Haitians up in Canada. That's its own culture by itself. Then you got the Haitians in France. That's its own culture by itself. You'll notice they talk different. They speak different. But at the end of the day, it's just a subculture within the culture. Of course, all cultures have their, you know, common foundational elements, but culture is not static. It, it adapts, it moves, depending on the geographical location, right? So when you talk about the Ugandan Americans delineating from the continental Ugandans, you acting like you just dropped the bomb of information. That's totally normal, right? If a Ugandan is born and raised in Washington, D.C., they're obviously going to have a different experience, a different, you know, different dialect, a different slang, a different style of dress than the Ugandan that was born and raised somewhere in Kampala, Uganda. But the Ugandan American is never going to say, I'm not a Ugandan or I don't got no connection to Uganda. The delineation movement you're talking about that was created by your Lord and Savior, Tariq Nasheed, that's not a, a direct comparison. Because what he is saying is we have no connection to Africa. We are disconnected from Africa. We are an amalgamation of the Native Americans. We are a mixed race group. We have multiple lineages. We are a combination of the European, the Native American, and only a tiny smidgen fractional percent of the continental African. And we are a brand new race of people. That is the that is the delineation movement you're talking about. That's not a direct comparison you're trying to make. You have individuals in the so-called FBA delineation movement that say they have no connection to the continent. They weren't even from there. They, some of them even say, the slave trade never happened. The slave ships never happened. Now, I know the slave ships. I know the slave ships existed because my ancestors personally attacked and captured and rescued Africans off the slave ships 200 years ago. So I know the slave ships was really on the seas. But you got niggas in, in the FBA delineation movement talking about the slave ships never happened. We the Native Americans. We the indigenous population. So uh, it's not the same thing, right? Somebody saying I grew up in New York 
I'm of Ugandan descent is not the same thing as saying, nigga, I've never, I don't have no connection to Africa, nigga. I'm a Native American Choctaw Indian. It's not the same thing, nigga. Let's continue. Right? But let's just get to the point, Shay Sharday. If you lived here, you would soon find out that just because you've been to Africa for a week or two, or just because you've been here for a month, you're gonna find out that it's much differently than what you actually feel. And people treat you so much differently when you're living on the continent of Africa. Let's talk about the fact that we get abused over here too. The thing about Ghana is stop crying victim. Stop crying victim, because y'all cheat us out of a lot of stuff. Y'all invited us to come home, which by the thousands we did. We came running to Ghana. People sold their homes, moved out of their apartments, sold everything. Some people packed up uh, containers and moved over here just to get over here and realize this is not our home. Y'all call us foreigners. Ghanaians call us that. We didn't make that word up. We didn't start calling ourselves that. We don't know that that's what y'all call the white people and the Chinese because we're not around them. But we know that that's what y'all call us. I, I ain't never heard the word before, Tabi, till I came to Ghana. And the reality is that as black people from America, what we tend to do is just start loving everybody because we're black. We now, in this section of the video, O'Shea tells O'Shea Sade, if you came to Africa, you're going to, oh, it's not brotherly love as they claim to advertise and things like that. And then he attaches a video of this lady talking about the negative experiences she's had in Ghana. And that's why I say if one video or one interaction is enough for you to really sway your opinion, then you're not solid because, bro. I can give you a list of negative experiences I've had growing up in America at the hands of other black folks, right? I remember one time I was in the second grade. I was, I got up, you know, my father got me dressed. He about to drop me off at school, right? We go to his car. He had an Infinity J30, 1998, right? Then I see the window smashed out the car. I see the radio gone, right? Boom. I remember one time my mom got me dressed to go to school, right? Got me dressed. We going out. The car not even in the driveway. They stole the whole damn car. See, they stole my dad's radio, but this time they stole my mom's whole fucking car. Now, somehow they were able to find it across town. I remember as a teenager, like I said, got robbed at gunpoint by another black man, right? Shit was crazy. And like I mentioned before, as recent as this year, multiple, multiple, multiple shoplifting incidents at the hands of other black men. And every day and every week, Tariq Nasheed comes on YouTube and brags about, oh, yeah, we opened the doors for the black immigrants. We opened the doors. If it wasn't for us, the black immigrants wouldn't be able to come to the United States, nigga. Like the United States is the land of milk and honey, nigga. Like it's a bunch of black American multinational corporations waiting to employ the black immigrants. No, we got to get here and, and get to grinding by our fucking self, nigga. Got to work for the white man. Got to gotta scrub toilets and do security because, nigga. We ain't no jobs waiting for us when we get here. Tariq Nasheed talking all this big shit. Nigga, ain't no black American multinational corporations waiting to employ us on a large scale. So we got to get it out the mud by our fucking self. Meanwhile, O'Shea, you can hop on a fucking plane, go to Uganda with nothing but a backpack and a laptop and become a multi-millionaire. We can't come over here and do the same shit. It's a bunch of black immigrants that come to the United States and fail, end up on the streets, end up on drugs. Or maybe they work in a dead end jobs, 14 hours a day, standing on their feet just to send maybe like $100, $200 back home to their family. Meanwhile, O'Shea back in Uganda living like a goddamn oligarch, dealing with the caliber of women that he would never have access to in the United States. Tell the truth, bro. Tell the truth. If you were in the United States, you would not have the same access to the caliber of Ugandan women that you are intermingling with back on the continent, bro. They would not they would not be fucking with you, bro. They wouldn't be fucking with you. But because you have the American dollar, the American passport, because of the opportunities afforded to you by the continental African man, by the black man on the continent, you are able to access certain amenities in life that would never be in your grasp or in your reach back in the United States of America, back in your home state, back in your home nation. And you know it's a fact. You know it's a fact, bro. You'd be a local joker back in Sacramento, but you could be a local oligarch in Uganda. And also in the video that O'Shea attached about the uh, the lady, she said, oh, the, the Ghanaians called us this and the Ghanaians called us that. That's what I mean when I say your, these, your foundation is not solid, man. Your foundation is not solid, man. Because if I allowed the names that I was called or that my people were called to cloud my judgment, because Haitians, I always stand by it. Haitians got it the worst out of any any ethnic group, any black ethnic group. Haitians have received the most slander, the most disrespect especially so you know if we want to go by oh they call this mean names then that haitians should be the ones delineating the hardest by all you niggas because haitians have been disrespected on a global scale right but i'm still standing on blackness i'm still standing on business now i was born in the mid 90s but i got homies i got relatives that tell me about how when they was coming up in the 80s and the 90s and even the early 2000s it was not all love for the haitians you see the haitians in the modern day got a little more respect on their name now but back in the day it was no love for the haitians right it was no love for the haitians so 
when I hear people talking about, oh, they call me mean names and they call me mean names and nigga, you're soft, nigga. You are soft as baby shit, nigga. I ain't trying to hear none of that, bro. Cause like I said, my people got it the worst and we ain't crying like hoes. And then towards the end of the clip, O'Shea said, oh, as black people in America, we ride for people just cause we black. Nigga, Haitians was the first one to ride for people just on the basis of blackness, just on the standard of blackness. Like I said earlier in the video, we was attacking the slave ships on the fucking ocean, nigga, to rescue our fellow blacks. And what do we get in return? We got disrespected, we got slandered, we got shitted on for hundreds of years. And guess what? I'm still standing on blackness. I'm still standing on business. I'm still standing on ancestral business. So listen. Like I said, your foundation is not solid, and nigga, move around, nigga. We don't need none of these um, these fair weather ass niggas in the movement. Let's continue. Because when we try to become one Africa or one black world, we gotta understand that the brothers and sisters in Africa don't grow up like that. That's how we see the world, or how we would love to see a world that doesn't exist. That's an idea. That's a theory, all right? And in theory, a lot of the things you talk about are correct, right? Like we should not be, you know, beefing in the black world and we should look to give value to each other. Not that you've said that specifically, but you have hinted at such things, which I concur. Now in this section of the clip, O'Shea says, oh, we can't do certain things like this because, oh, you know, the black folks in, in Africa, they don't grow up like that or we didn't grow up like that. Man, any population of people can have their mentality change over a course of a couple generations. 150 years ago, Christianity wasn't widespread throughout Western Central Africa, but now look how large it spread in a very short time. 150 years ago, a black man on, on the West Coast of Africa, he would have been like, Jesus Christ, nigga, I'll be with Ogun, I'll, I'll be with Shango, nigga, what are you talking about, right? Now, fast forward to the modern day, he's all about Jesus, and he'll slap the fire out you if you disrespect Jesus. Same thing with the brothers who engage in Islam. Once upon a time, them brothers wasn't in the Quran like that. But nowadays, some of them are very passionate about the Quran and some of them are so passionate about Islam that they engage in all out jihad against the government. So when I hear somebody try to make the argument against Pan-Africanism based on the current ideology of the people alive today, that doesn't bother me because I can take a child two, three, four years old and I can indoctrinate him in all the principles and in all the ideologies of Pan-Africanism in a very short time. Same way I myself was indoctrinated under that environment, under those ideologies, and look how I came out as a grown man. So like I said, it's all about the foundation you're given as a child. And as we can tell around the world, around the global black world, we can admit that the vast majority of us are not given the proper foundation as children, right? That's why we got so many sambos, so many sellouts. We got women divesting, kissing the ass of white men. Obviously the foundation we were given as children was not the proper foundation to be given to us as children, but that can be changed, right? That can be changed. You might not be able to change adults, but children, you can send children in a different direction. Now, O'Shea also mentioned something about one Africa or one black world. Now on my channel, I've never advocated for, you know, one, Africa or one culture or one black world. I never advocated for anybody giving up their cultural identity. No, I simply said that black men, we need to come together on the basis of our common interests against our common adversaries. And then guys like O'Shea or guys like Tariq would say, oh, we can't do that because of of these negative experiences that I had, you know, once upon a time. But when you look at the Europeans, for example, right, when they've established things such as NATO and the United Nations, these are groups that went to war with each other over a period of many centuries, like the French and the British at one point, the French and the Americans were beefing, now the French and the Americans, they best buddies, things like that, right? These are individuals who went to war, right? Bombs dropping from the sky, right? Naval fleets engaging in blockades, right? You know, whole towns being put under siege. Now, fast forward to the modern day, they are geopolitical allies, right? They cooperate when it comes to foreign policy, things like that, and these are individuals who they didn't simply have, you know, a few negative experiences. Oh, he he spoke to me in a disrespectful way. Oh, he did this to me. He stole some money from me. These are individuals who engaged in world wars. These are individuals like the French and the British who were fighting for like a thousand years straight. You could take the Americans and the French. A large reason why the French no longer have a presence in North America or in the Americas in general is because the Americans drove them out. The Americans played a part in destroying the French empire in this side of the world. But now fast forward to the modern day, you know, Joe Biden and Emmanuel Macron taking pictures like best buddies, you know what I'm saying? They the best of friends, right? They cooperate when it comes to foreign policy in Africa in destroying the black man, right? But meanwhile, they got a history of warfare against each other, right? The Frenchman, he not holding a grudge from 20 years ago because the Americans drove him out the continent, no. So these little petty squabbles you niggas be talking about, nigga, that shit is child's play to me. That shit is goofy shit. But like I said, when your foundation is not solid, you always gonna have that, you know, 
that that sambo in, inside your heart. You still want, you know, O'Shea, yeah, he's Pan African, but O'Shea definitely still got a little sambo in him, you know, especially if you follow him on Tariq Nasheed, right? Definitely got a little sambo in him. And here's the thing, O'Shea, you got to understand. I know you try to play both sides. You try to navigate the African world while trying to, you know, connect to the FBA social media audience and a social media fan base because like i said you and Tariq share a lot of the same subscribers but you have to understand the fba side of the game they have no interest in connecting with africa bro and you know that you know that right but you, you try to play both sides but they have no interest in doing what you're doing right they're all about the stars and stripes and the red white and the blue and things like that right they, they don't give a fuck about none of that shit bro so that's why at times it may seem that your ideology is inconsistent because you're trying to you're trying to play to both sides of the, of the argument when it comes to individuals who have an international mindset who see things geopolitically from a global perspective there is no personal interaction that's going to stop them from doing that and for those who just want to do whatever they're doing there's no there's no convincing them so at the end of the day you have to understand these are two opposing political factions those who want to collaborate will continue to collaborate and those who want to delineate will continue to delineate right and that's fine but we'll see who comes out more powerful in the end now let's continue. One group is not giving to the other group in exchange for the value that we say that we should have for one another on paper. And that is the problem right now in the black world. The real issue that FBA has with some of these other groups out there that come to America is that, listen, um, you know, historically, we've been contributing to the Pan-African ideology or to other black immigrants coming into America. I believe that Martin Luther King signed the Immigrant Act of 1965, which helped black immigrants come into America. And what African-Americans are saying is that, hey, listen, you guys don't really give the same respect back to us. And now, in this section of the clip, O'Shea mentioned how there were civil rights leaders like Martin Luther King that were instrumental in opening doors for the black immigrants. Right. And for the most part, that's true. Now, it's not true for my people because Haitians been coming here since the late 1700s. Right. So, I mean, we've been stomping all over here. But for the most part, you could say on a large scale after the 60s and the 70s that's when the black immigrants began migrating over here now of course you may have some groups and individuals that came back in the early 1900s late 1800s but for the most part that is correct now also in that clip o'shea launches a similar argument that i've heard from Tariq nasheed many times before right we have contributed so much and we have contributed so much and the immigrants they don't give nothing back they don't give shit back now let's take a step back and look at the bigger picture right in order to benefit from immigration and this applies to any group of demographic, you need to have systems and structures in place to be able to capitalize off that value, right? And as of right now, we gotta say it like it is, those structures are simply, they're not there in the black community, right? When you look at other immigrant groups that arrive in the country, they are able to step into pre-existing economic networks. The Chinese immigrants, they can connect with the Chinese owned businesses, the Chinese restaurants, the Chinese supply chains, the Indians come to the country, you know, they already tapped in in tech and finance and retail. The Arabs come through, they got their gas station chains and grocery stores and retail shops and their cell phone shops already active, already moving, already bumping. So those groups are able to capitalize off the dollar of their population right they're able to circulate their dollars because those structures and mechanisms are already in place but when you look at the black immigrants when they come to the united states they just off in the wilderness they just often they just off in the wilderness by themselves they off in the jungle by themselves right there ain't no large-scale black-owned businesses and economic networks ready to absorb them they got to go work for the white man they got to go work security they got to drive a cab they got to drive uber they got to be a cna and wipe somebody's ass cheeks there ain't no large scale chains or networks of, of cell phone stores that the black immigrants can come through, you know, get their Metro PCS, you know, prepaid phone. There's no telecom companies to provide services to the black immigrants. There's no expansive retail chains to offer jobs, right? So when the black immigrant needs a phone, he needs clothes, he needs groceries, he needs housing. They got to go spend money with these outside groups because these mechanisms aren't even in place. But at the same time, guys like Tarina Sheeta and O'Shea Duke Jackson going to say, we're not getting the value. We can't capitalize off the value. Nigga, how the fuck are you going to capitalize in a system of capitalism when you ain't even got a fucking store, nigga? Now, when you make this argument, you need to be specific. You have to say that we are unable to capitalize off the black immigrant dollar because we don't have the infrastructure in place to capitalize off it but the black immigrant is contributing they are paying their taxes they are getting up they are going to work they are working their job they're contributing to society but just make the correction you cannot capitalize off that because the mechanisms aren't in place for that to happen and of course we know the historical reasons behind that but nigga don't try to come in and point the finger at the black immigrant because of that because at this point then i'm just going to assume that you're economically illiterate or you're trying to push some propaganda 
or both. Because when it comes to me, like I said, my family owns multiple stores. So we are able to capitalize off the black dollar. Not only the black dollar, but also the Mexican dollar, the Dominican dollar, the, the Honduran dollar, the Guatemalan dollar, the Russian the Russian dollar, the white dollar, the Nigerian dollar, the Senegalese dollar, the Bangladeshi dollar, the Sri Lankan dollar, the black American dollar, the Russian dollar. But before my father was able to establish his own enterprises, before my father was able to establish his own stores, where did he have to work? He had to work 10 years for the white man to stack that bread how come he couldn't work for the black man during that time because the black man didn't have the infrastructure ready at the time the black man wasn't ready yet the black man wasn't ready but then that same black man gonna turn around and point the finger at the black migrant talking about you it's not an equal exchange you're not giving me equal value my nigga you don't even got nothing for sale you don't even got nothing for sale let's continue I can tell you, I live in Uganda. There is a delineation factor that's so strong that as a black American, you have to give a lot to this country for them to let you in. You have to prove yourself. And I don't have an issue with that. I'm still proving myself every day. The question is, why don't they have to prove themselves to us? Why is it that when it comes to us being here, we have so many loops or things to jump over? It's not easy finding out how to do it. something in Africa or most African countries. You don't get a whole lot of help, Sade. And I don't know if you understand that because you've never really lived here before and you don't understand the trials and tribulations that many of the people that are trying to come back to the, the continent from the diaspora are actually facing but we get to see that pan-africanism or lack thereof in effect okay it's not there it, it, it's there in theory it's there somewhere on a piece of paper but it's not there in activity or action and that's the issue here and again i, I find myself in other black people other african americans whether in ghana whether they're in tanzania many have told their story to me on my podcast i visit them in their homes and it's us always given to others and then at the same time what about what do they give now in this section of the clip O'Shea was talking about how it's so hard it's so hard being an immigrant from the west in Africa it's so hard you know we don't get no help we gotta grind we gotta work hard nigga what the fuck nigga go talk to a black immigrant living in the west they'll tell you the same shit they'll tell you the same shit at least they got systems in place over there to plug you in Nigga, when we get here, nigga, ain't nothing here. We off in the wilderness. See, somebody like Dinah Samir can go to, uh, I forget what country did a Dinah Samir go to, Sierra Leone, and he could meet the president. He could come to Sierra Leone as a YouTuber and meet the president. Why? Because he's able to obtain that access as a citizen coming from the West with his American passport and his American dollar. Meanwhile, the local Sierra Leonean citizen, they're not meeting the president. Hell nah. I remember Pan-Africanism Strikes Back, you know, Brandon Tucker also from California, your native California. He be talking about how he went to Kenya and he already connected with members of parliament and things like that. You can't do that. You talking about uneven exchange. Ain't no migrant coming to the United States meeting, meeting members of the Senate, meeting the president, taking selfies with the president. That ain't happening. And like I already told you, your American dollar goes way farther in Uganda. You're able to establish and maintain an entire media company over in Uganda, something you'd never be able to do to the same scale in your native Sacramento, California. So like I said, if you ask me, I just think that even though you have evolved mentally and you've embraced some of the Pan-African ideology, your foundation is still at its core is still heavily influenced by your formative years and who you originally were, right? Originally, you were a very patriotic Sambo back in the day right so you still are that patriotic sambo still deep down right because that's who you are that's how you were formed and and raised in your formative years and i also believe that you're also a big fan of Tariq nasheed so that's why you support him as well as the fact that you guys share a lot of the same audience members so you definitely want to you know you definitely want to play up to your audience as well because i go through your comment section man whole bunch of sambos in that comment section man you still have a lot of the same subscribers from your old manosphere days when you were part of the black manosphere you know the red pill movement before you jumped into the old pan-african thing a lot of y'all boys in that space are a bunch of tap dancing trump supporting sambo sellouts and that's the reason why a lot of y'all have a hostility towards africa and when it comes to Tariq nasheed like i said he's just pushing propaganda i think if you ask me i think Tariq nasheed got a bag to push a certain political ideology a lot of you guys in the so-called pro-black space a lot of you guys are compromised because you are trying to push a certain line or certain ideology when it comes to me that's why i'm the most I'm the most well-rounded voice in this space because I can speak on topics such as geopolitics from a local level, domestically, internationally, historically, right? I can talk about what's happening in Mali. I can talk about the local elections. I can talk about what's happening in Kenya. I can talk about what's happening. Bro, I'm well-rounded, well-versed because 
my allegiance is only towards my ancestors, right? Tariq Nasheed's allegiance is towards some right-wing think tank that gave him a bag of money. That's why you'll see Tariq Nasheed constantly talk about, oh, the Africans fleeing to the United States, the Africans fleeing, without mentioning the fact that Africans, actually the vast majority of Africans are gonna live and die in their country. Actually, if you look at the black immigrant population in the United States, it's actually one of the smallest immigrant populations in the entire country. Actually, Africans are currently the most revolutionary group of blacks in the world right now, kicking out the Western multinational corporations and destroying European multinational corporations right now. Actually, if you wanna be 100% truthful, right? Evicting European militaries from their national territory. If you wanna be honest, it's the Africans that standing on black business right now, right? The rest of you niggas making youtube channels and talking shit if you want to be honest 100 percent for real for real right but tarina she will never mention that because then he'll have to confront the fact that i'm just a stupid youtuber in my basement running my fucking mouth meanwhile black men across the black men across the waters black men back on the continent they're really at war economically diplomatically and physically at war meanwhile i'm not doing shit but running my mouth and counting money meanwhile the black men that i'm disparaging are actually standing on business and actually destroying and going to war with the entire global european power structure and i'm just a stupid old nigga in my basement talking shit selling t-shirts and o'shea the only thing you're doing is making celebrity gossip videos for a paycheck that's what you do for a living you make celebrity gossip videos and then you want to complain that the africans might not look at what you do with the highest esteem right maybe they don't really respect what you do nigga because all you do is sit around oh my god you know guess what happened to uh this girl on loving hip-hop Oh my God, guess what happened to Tory Lanez? Oh my God, look what Shaquille O'Neal said to Angel Reese. Oh my God, look what happened with Tiffany Henyard. Oh my God, look what happened to Fresh and Fit and Myron. Oh my God, a transgender was caught cheating on her man. Oh my God. Now listen, bro, I could do the same exact thing you do. I'm more charismatic, I'm more well-rounded, I'm more intelligent. I'm just an altogether, you know, I'm just a very dynamic black man. And if I really wanted to, I could make content Content on the same subject matter that you do and my channel would blow past you right but i only really want to make content on things that i give a fuck about i can tell you don't you don't give a fuck about none of the shit you talk about bro you are doing it strictly for the paycheck so you can trick off on some ugandan thotties that's really what it is i only talk about things that i'm passionate about so yeah i see the same topics you talk about i could talk about tory lanes too i could talk about i could do some celebrity shade room gossip content too but that's just beneath me that's just beneath me as a black man bro i'm just you know it's just beneath me I'd rather talk about Mali destroying the Canadian multinational gold mining firms. I'd rather talk about Niger destroying the French uranium multinational corporations. I'd rather talk about topics that actually matter, right? You and Tariq, you niggas don't be talking about nothing. You be talking about celebrity gossip and Tariq Nasheed be debating, you know, crackheads and shit. I don't know what the fuck. He be on his channel going back and forth with crackheads and Uber drivers. You know, you guys are not, in, you know, informative black men. Like, you guys are just not. That's why... I'm, I'm the best voice in the whole space. You niggas ain't on shit. You niggas ain't doing shit. And I'm going to be the king of the trap very soon. I'm going to be the king of the space very soon. Now, anyways, man, it's Boy Never Call You back in the Billy SD. Cash app in the description. Support the channel, man. Support the album. Peace. No. Feel like I'm 75. None of your team be full of them traders. You know that can never be mine. I'm grabbing a thought when I drive. I'm back in my zone and we young. She said that she ready to come be my wife. Yeah, hoping I don't do her wrong. I gave her my word and it's wrong. I'm whipping the best like a lamb. No chicken and lamb Accustomed to call me the man I never be up on the gram I'm keeping that way undercover She want me to tell her I love her I told her I'm breaking the rules I told her we making the news Back in my city they loving me Standing alone I'm a hundred deep Enemy plotting is still in reach They trying to make sure that we underneath Trying to make sure that we never make it Coming for power come get acquainted Coming for everything that I wanted Feeling like Drake but I really wrote it Feeling like Kendrick I'm checking names Gotta roll up while I go insane Got so much stress I've been gated away Stuffing these racks in this Louis case One thing for certain I'm about to check Keeping 100 and nothing less Stick with the family since day one Had to stay down in my day come Had to stay down but I'm never patient Hop on the mic and I'm motivated Hop on the mic and I drive a classic Haters can't see me they copping glasses Back in the studio making magic Got a new tape and it's in production Back on my business I got a budget Staying low key when I'm out in public Feel like I'm 75 None of your team be full of them traders You know that can never be mine I'm grabbing a thought when I drive I'm back in my zone and we young She said that she ready to come be my wife Yeah, hoping I don't do her wrong I gave her my word and it's wrong I'm webbing the best like a lamb I mean no chicken and lamb Accustomed to call me the man I never be up on the gram I'm keeping that way undercover She want me to tell her I love her I told
told her I'm breaking the rules. I told her we making the news. Breaking the rules, yeah, yeah. Know that we making it.